my feet and a light unto my path. Today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing and miracles. Today I open myself to God's word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved, I'm God's servant, I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's talk about this thing called social media this global phenomenon. By the way, just to know who I'm talking to, how many of you are on social media? Could you just raise your hands? You know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. There's so many things. You know what they say nowadays? If you're not on social media, technically, you don't exist. This thing called social media is one of the most pervasive and most powerful realities today. Not even tomorrow, it's today. And I, I really believe that it's going to outlast you and me. It's going to outlast our children, our children's children. You know, it's here to stay. So we might as well learn something about this. In the Bible, in the good book, you will never find anything that talks directly about social media. Why? Because the internet wasn't around 2,000 years ago. You know, Jesus never had an iPhone. Jesus couldn't post his, his inspirational quotes on Instagram, you know. Could you imagine if the internet was already available back then? The scripture would be completely different. There was a technological advancement during that time. You know, they weren't really low tech. The first tablet was already invented then. Who used the first tablet? Moses. That's right. Moses literally downloaded data straight from the cloud. <laughs> that's right. But you know what, my friends? Even if the Bible doesn't talk about social media, at the very core and at the very nature of this topic, it's all about connections. Everybody say connections. And that, my dear friends, the Bible has a lot to say about connections, all right? You would imagine in this, in this Facebook infested world that we live in, you know, in spite of all the likes that you could probably get from your Facebook post or the, the number of followers or friends that you would have on Instagram, there seems to be, I've noticed, there seems to be a growing loneliness among people. Did you notice that? And you know what? If Mother Teresa or Saint Teresa were, were still alive, she would definitely agree because she was one who said that the biggest disease that we fight today is not, it's not leprosy or cancer or tuberculosis. No, rather it's the feeling of being unwanted, being uncared for, or being left behind or being deserted by everyone you love. Because that's what loneliness is, my dear friends. It's a desperate lack of intimacy in our lives. And that's what makes things so ironic. Because we live in a hyper-connected world. If you're on Facebook, did you know that you are supposed to be connected to 1.4 billion people? That's a lot of people. And yet it's also this hyper-connectedness that has somehow given us this false sense of knowing. What do I mean by that? You have a long list of friends in your Facebook account, right? Or your Instagram. But it seems that sometimes, it seems that a lot of people know you or you know a lot of people. But do you really know them? Or do they really know you? You get what I'm saying? somehow it's superficial it's only on the surface but don't get me wrong all right Low, uh, social media does not cause loneliness it doesn't loneliness has been around since the time of adam and eve just like suicide has been around since the time of judas social media is not evil it's the use of social media that will determine if it'll be used for good or evil if you use it for the wrong reasons you know what it can certainly cover up a lot of faults, insecurities, and depression wherein otherwise you can, you can get real help. Let's talk about, let me give you an example, all right? Let's talk about Judas. Judas, you, you all know Judas. Judas, the disciple who betrayed Jesus. Nobody likes Judas. In fact, if Judas were alive today, you would totally, I, I guarantee you, you would totally block that guy out from your page, right? Unfollow that guy for doing what he did to Jesus. But he, his life teaches us something very important. In fact, in John, let's go to John 13, 21. 
during the last supper before Jesus was to be crucified he says amen amen I say to you one of you will betray me you all know who he's referring to but during this time the disciples didn't that's what that's what shocked them because they they didn't know that a brother a fellow disciple would would betray Jesus in fact it says 22 verse 22 the disciples looked at one another at a loss to whom he meant one of his disciples the one whom Jesus loved pertaining to John was reclining at Jesus' side so Simon Peter nodded to him to find out whom he meant here's what's shocking for the, for the for these disciples back then in biblical times when you decide to be a disciple of a master you literally followed that person everywhere he went here's a question how come nobody even knew that Jesus that Judas was going to betray Jesus no one knew they trusted the guy they even made, uh, made him to be their treasure did they know Judas yes they did but did they really know Judas I don't think so because nobody even suspected that he was already scheming the darkest crime in all of human history if only Judas had someone to talk to things would have been so much different he would have witnessed the risen Christ in all of his glory but that's not what happened you have a lot of people online and you think that your connections because you have a lot of friends you are well connected but some of that connections are just superficial it's only on the surface level you got to dig deeper my friend you got to get deeper connections social media is a wave that is unstoppable the only thing you can do when a wave comes is you need to be able to ride it everybody say ride the wave that's right ride the wave now here's what I'm saying on the internet before you can even learn how to ride the wave you need to learn how to surf everybody say surf I'll give you surfing 101 lessons in surfing they have this term called a duck dive let's show the picture there you might have seen this in the in the movies or or, or in pictures where in order to, to get past a big wave if you go above you know what will happen the wave will just take you back to where you started or chances are you know you get wiped out or you'll drown the only way you get past a big wave is to go under it to go deeper the internet is the biggest wave we have ever seen today if you're not mature enough to handle it you're gonna drown you're gonna wipe out what you need is to learn how to dive into deeper connections everybody say open up let me begin with that I love this analogy baby fish goes to mommy fish and says mommy 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 I'm thirsty and mommy fish of course what what and 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 brother fish and sister fish and uncle fish and auntie fish and grandma fish and grandpa all of the what 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 and you know baby fish just said uh mommy i'm thirsty and and mommy said you're 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 a fish <laughs> you're surrounded by the pacific ocean the biggest body of water in the planet you're thirsty yeah yeah mom I'm thirsty mommy fish talk to daddy fish do we know of a psychi psychi psychologist psychiatrist you know there's something wrong with everybody baby all you have to, you don't have to go to the refrigerator get a pitcher of water put it in a glass you don't have to do that baby all you have to do is open up open up and let the water come in my dear friends we're that fish and God has given us a Pacific Ocean of His love surrounding all of us. And all you have to do if you need the love of God is tell somebody beside you, open up. But here's the thing, and many people don't understand this part. Everybody say part. Part of God's love is found in the imperfect people in your life. And that if you have a relationship with them, and if you go deeper in that relationship, and if you open up yourself to that relationship, then the love of God, part of God's love, flows into your life. In fact, I'm going to begin with Scripture in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, can we read it together? Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. That's what God wants us to do, but how can you do it? How can you do it? How can we do it if we are not opening up? You don't even know that that, that other person has a burden. 
What we need to do is to do two things. How many? We need to do two things. And the first one is we've got to be present. Everybody say, be present. Our problem is that we're not present to one another. And the, the, the thing that I, I, I want us to, to be able to say, you know, people, when people are going through burdens in their life, you need to be present for that person. Are you listening to what I'm saying? When somebody is going through something, and you see that in that person's face. You see that in how that person walks. You see in how that person deals with others. And you see, you, you, you know that there's like a, a cloud, a heavy, dark cloud over that person. You notice that there are four magical words that you can tell that person that will make that person survive another day. You know what those magical words are? I'm here for you. Can we practice? Practice. Tell somebody beside you. I'm here for you. That that's, you know, when, when people are going through defeat, going through despair, going through all sorts of crazy things happening in that person's life, you know, if, if, if somebody just accompanies that person and says, I'm here for you, that person can survive the storm, be able to plod on and put one foot in front of the other because that person knows there's another human being that is there beside that person. Are you listening to what I'm saying? The epidemic of loneliness is caused by the virus of distraction. Everybody say distraction. Meaning to say, ask me what? We're here, but we're not here. You know, we, we're, we're in front of somebody, but our mind is a thousand miles away. Our hearts are pulled into a hundred directions. Where, what's happening is we're physically present, but we're mentally, emotionally, and spiritually absent. And... That's the problem. We're not listening. You need to listen. We need to listen to one another. Listen with your body and with your soul. Listen with intention and compassion. Listen where, where you're able to, you know, people tell me that I'm a good listener. But I have, a, I have something that I need to correct in my listening. You want, you want, you want to know what it is? I listen so that I can respond instead of listening so that I can understand. That, that's, that's, a diff, that's a big difference there. And there's a nuance. You, what, 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 when you're talking to me and I'm listening, what's happening is I'm listening and I'm trying to formulate in my mind how to respond to what you're saying. But what you need more than my response is, you want me to understand. Do you get what I'm saying? And it's so important. In the book of James, let's go to there. Let's go to the book of James chapter 1 verse 19. It says, lead with your ears. Follow up with your tongue. So the ears come first. Let the tongue follow. But you've got to listen first. Everybody say listen. Elbow somebody beside you. You better listen more. Remember St. Francis? He had this beautiful prayer. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. And the chorus. Oh, Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console to be, this is a beautiful line, to be understood as to understand. You listen, thank you for attending my concert. Uh, <laughs> but you, you listen, not just to be understood, but you listen so that you could understand. That's the, cru the crucial thing. And that's what I want to share with you. One of the, one of the, practical things I'm going to give to you right now, and some of you will not like what I'm going to say, but, but I'm going to say it anyway. When you're talking to another human being, 
We need to stop this. Ah, okay. Tapos. Ah, ah, okay. Ah, okay. Beep, beep, beep. Ah. So, it's important. Important. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Na. Oh, and then, <laughs> good talaga. Ah, that's good. Oh, sige, sige, tuloy lang. I'm listening, I'm listening. So, kaya ko to, kaya ko. I, I, I can do three things at the same time. Sige na, sige na. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, tapos. Ay, naku! Oh, no, no, ito, ito, ito. ito. You know, we, that's horrible. That is absolutely horrible. It is disrespectful. You are not giving value to the person in front of you. Am I making sense to you? And, and you know, researchers have studied this phenomenon. When there is a phone on the table between two people, or three people, or four people, if there is one phone in front of them, you know what happens? Even if they don't use the phone, the conversation, the quality, and the depth of the conversation plummets. You know why? Ask me why. Because the phone gives everybody the idea, the possibility that the, that the conversation will be interrupted by the phone. And because it will be possibility of interruption, the converse, everybody makes the conversation light and superficial. But they've noticed this. Researchers have noticed this. Put the phone out of sight. Put the phone in the bag. Put the phone in the pocket. Guess what happens? The conversation deepens. And so, I want you to make this decision from now on. Tell somebody beside you, magbago na tayo. <laughs> you want to have a deeper relationship with the people in your life. And it's... I love my phone, guys. I mean, I use this phone like crazy. I, 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 go, I go social media, use it for God. We're, we're going to talk about that in another talk. But I, I want you to know that you also have to be disciplined. Yes? And, and you've got to, everybody say again, be present. The second thing you've got to do is be open. Everybody say, be open. I'm going to ask you a big question. And I hope you answer this. Everybody say, I'm ready. Do the closest people in your life know, know the burdens that you're carrying? Stop hiding. Stop pretending you're strong. Friends, you've got to understand this, that you, you, you've got to have the ability to tell another human being, I've got a problem, I'm facing something, I have an issue, I'm carrying a burden. Can you listen? Will you help me? Can you just be with me? Can you hold my hand? You have to have that ability. Because here's the thing. We need comrades. But we need confidants too. We need comrades. Friends, teammates, workmates, we need that, but they're not enough. You need confidants. Two people or three people or four people who will know everything that's happening to you. The burden, the pain, the emotion, the difficulty. You, they, they, you need that inner circle to be able to protect you and to be able to walk with you in this journey. Do not travel life alone because when you... I want you, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. You're carrying a burden and you're doing it alone. And no matter how strong you are, pretending you are strong, here's what's going to happen. It's going to crush you at a certain day, at a certain time. But that's the picture of so many people Pretending to be strong, not telling anyone, going through life. You know, if you only tell one person, just one person, what's happening to you, things will be so much better. Because if you can just tell someone, open up. Everybody say open up. This is what happens. And then what you do is you tell someone else. 
And then you tell another person. And when you've got a small circle of confidence, sharing your story, sharing your burden, this is what happens. I want to thank God that my wife is my confidant. You know, when I was younger, I, I would be carrying a burden. And, you know, it's, it's almost like being a guy. You don't want to open up. You, don't, you know, even if she was my wife, it's like, oh, I can do this. I can handle this. And uh, it would take about three days before I tell her <laughs> that I'm, I'm, there's this problem at work. Or Now I'm older. The moment I go through, I, I, I know that, oh, it's a burden. Oh, it's a challenge. I, I instantly, I go to my wife and I say, sweetheart, uh, there's something that's bo been bothering me. You know, that, the moment I share it, the moment it comes out of my mouth, half of the weight is gone. It's like, ah, it's beautiful. And, and I, I, aside from my wife, I've got other confidants, brothers in the Lord, fellow preachers, my mentors. It's amazing when you've got confidants. And I believe God has already provided this confidants in your life. He's lined them up. They're not perfect, but they're there and they are willing to walk with you. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with a story that, that's powerful. It happened recently. In the 17th century, <laughs> in Vietnam, there was this married couple and the wife got pregnant. And they were so happy, beyond themselves in joy. And, but war broke out in Vietnam. And the man had to serve the army. And so there was this tearful farewell. And he left. And for three long years, he was in the battlefield. After three years, he finally came back. And the first thing he saw was his wife, and a three-year-old boy. And my gosh, it was a beautiful reunion. And they embraced each other. And there were many tears of joy. And when they went into the house, the wife said, I'm going to prepare a beautiful dinner for us. It's a celebration. I'm going to go to the market now. Stay here. So the wife goes to the market. The man is left at home with a boy. And he sits down in front of the boy. And, and he says, I'm your daddy. Call me daddy. And the boy shook his head, refused. And he said, you're not my daddy. Who's this stranger in the house, right? I mean, the first time, I'm, you're, you're not my daddy. And then the boy said this, I have another daddy. He comes here every night. And mommy talks to him. And mommy cries with him. When mommy sits down, daddy sits down. When mommy lies down, daddy lies down. And his heart was crushed. You know, you can just imagine this father, just, just all the joy, all of a sudden evaporating in a blink of an eye. And then the wife came. And immediately noticed there was something wrong. The husband was not talking to her, not even looking at her. And instead of joining the dinner, he goes out of the house, goes to the bar and drinks. And tries to drown out all his sorrows. And for three long days, he drank and he drank and he drank the great suffering that was in his chest. In the meantime, the wife was also going through great suffering. And she was in the house, did not want to go out, could not understand why her husband was not talking to her, not even looking at her, until she could not take it anymore. 
She runs out of the house, runs into a river, and dies. The man, heard of the tragedy, goes home, takes care of his son. In the evening, he lights an oil lamp. And when the oil lamp, lamp was lit, the little boy smiled. And the little boy said, My daddy, my daddy is back. Pointing to the shadow of his father. And the little boy said, That's my daddy who comes every night. And mommy talks to him and mommy cries to him. And when mommy sits down, daddy sits down. And when mommy lies down, daddy lies down. And all of a sudden, the father realized what was happening. That perhaps, you know, when, when the boy turns three, the boy said, mommy, where's daddy? Why do my friends have daddies and I don't have a daddy? And then mommy saw her shadow on the wall. And the mommy said, here's your daddy. Every night, say good night to your daddy. And the truth came out, but it was too late. This story ended in a tragedy. Do you know why? Because both man and woman did not open up to one another. They did not talk. They did not confide. Two lessons. Lesson from the man. If you are carrying a burden, do not drown it with addictions. Do not drown it with alcohol or drugs or any other kind of addiction, whether it be gambling or porn or gaming or shopping or any kind of addiction. That's the design to cover up a burden. Don't do that. It's going to destroy you. Second lesson from the woman. When you're carrying a burden, don't stay at home and lock yourself in your room. You go out and you talk. If only the woman talked to the man, if only the man talked to the woman, if only they talked, if only they opened up and said, I have a burden. Can you listen? My dear friends, today I give you three, three things to do. Three action steps. Number one. Number one. You've got to commit to regular time with your confidants, whoever they are. Spouse, friend, parent, mentor. Number two. Invest yourself in a light group. The feast has light groups, small groups of people between 8 to 15 that meet regularly. They meet regularly to discuss about the messages at the feast. What did you learn? But not only that, they also share about what's happening to their lives. There's a table outside where you can sign up and say, I want a light group. I hope you seriously consider having that. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've always had a light group. Always. And it's amazing what a blessing it is to my life. I hope you enjoy it. Number three, make a decision to be gadgetless when you have conversations with people. What I want you to do now, I want you to come before the Lord because at the end of the day, Jesus is your number one confidant. I want you to go to God because you know what God is always telling you? He's always saying, I'm here for you. He's always there. No matter what you're going through, you're never alone. You're never, ever alone.